Johnson. You're listening to the Starting Block Podcast. Guys, this is a show for complete athletic development. The objective and the mission is to give you the tools to win, whether you're the athlete, the parent, or the coach. As always, I'm here with my co-host, Chris Scarborough. Good afternoon, sir. What's up? Good afternoon. Guys, like I said, the objective here is to give you guys the tools to win, whether you're the athlete, the parent, or the coach. Now, we do that by bringing you guys multiple shows within our show, all right? So the first episode that you'll hear from us is going to be a bi-weekly Q&A. That's where we take the questions you guys submit to us at. Info at startingblockpodcast.com. And we'll tackle them in that episode. That can be related to anything you want to know, guys. I mean, it doesn't have to be super technical. It can be broad if you want. But anything related to the training and performance, the rehab, nutrition, the neuro stuff, our guests, we'll tackle them there. Um, The next episode you'll get from us is going to be a biweekly guest interview. So that's going to be just like every other podcast on the planet. That's where we bring in our colleagues and friends from really across the globe, and they're going to share their stories of success, what they do with their clients, their athletes, their patients, and their clinics and gyms. And it's somebody that will share the same core values and mission that we do so you know we're all on the same page working together here. Another episode you'll get from us is going to be that Friday fire, or that's going to be about 15, 20 minutes of me just giving you guys a little bit of insight on a topic that just maybe I came across over the week or over my, you know, 15, 16 years of doing this that I feel like is relevant to, uh, you know, to any of you guys. And then a new segment that we have started to drop is our athlete spotlight. I think these are going to be like quarterly episodes where you'll get to hear from, you know, my athletes, Chris's athletes. And they're just going to share their stories, where where they started, how they came through our systems, where they're going to school. And just it's kind of cool because you get to hear a little bit more about real life, you know, training, right? What they did, um, how much they hated some of it, how much they loved some of it. And we've recorded a couple. We got a couple in the bank and they're pretty cool. So I think that's going to be more of a reoccurring episode as we go. So the final piece of that is going to be we don't run ads on the show. So all we ask is that if you buy into this mission, if you support this project, then share the show, guys. Just bring us a friend. If you bring us one person a show, we can grow this and we can help improve and change this industry because, quite frankly, this industry is shit to a huge degree. Anybody can go get a certification out of a cereal box. Heck, I know a lot of coaches that call themselves coaches that don't have any title behind them. Not that you per se need a great title, but you know what I mean. Like, there's just a lot of uh, people out here that are giving bad advice, and I'm sure I've probably given plenty of bad advice as well, um, probably on this show. But I try to give good advice. But the point of this is just to give you guys the tools you need and try to improve and, and better this industry. So that wraps up all the housekeeping i think it's enough of me rambling i think i covered it all didn't i chris i believe so yeah so let's get to it we've got q a today so let's uh let's get rolling man what's topic one all right chris and john i'm a 16 year old pitcher i have regular soreness at the at my by at the bottom of my bicep near my elbow how can i keep doing my bicep let me see if I can read this properly. My bicep curls the way I want to to make my arms look good and yet minimize the amount of soreness in my arm. Okay. All right. Well, what are your thoughts? Why don't you uh, you go first, and I'll, I'll jump on after that. Okay. Well, considering I know this person, <laughs> oh, okay. I know how yeah. they like to do bicep curls. They like to do the, we'll call it curls for the girls. Um you know, they, they love to do you know, the high volume, you know, repetitions for uh, for biceps. They lift with the bicep. They lower with the bicep. And let's face it, they do it to try to make the bicep and, the, and also the triceps. They try to make them look good. Well, the drawback to that is, is that, first of all, that's nowhere near the, the, that's nowhere near the way the arm is used to say de- decelerate the arm after it releases the ball, um, that bicep has got to lengthen and begin to decelerate that arm very rapidly at many thousands of degrees a second sometimes. Um, not in a very slow manner like it's done. It's a, a bodybuilding style movement. So 
so one of the, the best ways that we do, especially if this person wants to continue doing, um, you know, bicep curls for, for looks, okay? You're 16 years old. Yeah, you want to look good. You want to have your arms look good. You want to fill out your sleeves and everything. I get it. Well, you still have to train your muscle to be able to absorb force and be strong at it in its lengthened position. So um, this is where, John, we would – simply try to throw in at least the occasional um uh iso extreme bicep curl um this yeah. is where we would put the top of the tricep on top of say a, a glute ham uh, bench or even a just a flat bench with the person seated uh put the triceps on top of the bench and then uh with a usually a very light weight in their hand um anywhere from uh uh, if, if we're using a bar, we rarely go above 15 pounds for something like this. Um, if we're using a dumbbell, you know, we would usually go up to maybe five pounds in each hand, maybe. Um, and what they're doing is, if you can think of, of putting the tricep on the bench or on top of the uh, glute ham uh, roller, they would then try to straighten their elbow out. Okay, the, the bone of their elbow is pointing straight down toward the floor. They're trying to straighten their elbow out with the weight in their hand. So it's almost like they're engaging their tricep, but the bicep learns to get strong very long. And um, guys, after a while, I've seen people fail miserably um, and really want to quit after about a minute and a half of this. Um, it's, 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 um, it's much harder than it looks. So, uh, so I would recommend, that's usually what I recommend for people who, Yes, they want to continue doing their regular bicep, tricep, but this is something they can do to train that muscle to lengthen. Yeah. Yeah. I don't disagree with any of that. What I would add is I would also look to identify, are there any weaknesses in the forearm? So below the elbow as well, especially, didn't you say the soreness was at the lower part of the, the bicep area? Correct. No, Just above yeah. the elbow in the lower part of the so bicep. So everything Correct. around there, the pronator teres, uh, the the anconius, the supinator, any of these muscles around there, I'd take a look at those. Make sure things are working. It's just check that box. I'd also take a look at the opens pollicis muscle in your thumb as well. There's a big correlation with dysfunction there and how it relates to the elbow and bicep. Another thing is, depending on if it's bothering you doing a certain throw, I would definitely take a look at how you're throwing your changeup. I found that to be a very, depending on how you throw a circle change and you grip it, I found that to be very troublesome, especially in the bicep. Those are just a couple of little things that I would look at as well. But then I agree with Chris 100%. You've got to look at the timing aspect of the muscle. So part of your ability to throw is the extension of your arm. You can't throw with your arm curled. You've got to be able to extend it. And the ability for you to extend that arm and release is going to be based on how that tricep contracts, which will cause that arm to extend. But that's also based on how the bicep lengthens. And if you're sitting there doing curls all day, bro, like you're not going to be able to extend that arm. It just doesn't work that way. You're going to throw the timing of it off. Right. Now, yeah. does that mean that we never do bicep work no we do we definitely incorporate more of what chris was talking about things like iso extreme you know, preacher curl rebounds impulse work things like that but there's still a time and place where yeah you want to get some size cool but understand how size on the arm is built well first off let's say this there's a reason that most pitchers don't look like a chapman real talk there's a reason that most pitchers don't look like him. He's one in a million, right? A genetic freak. Sure, his arms are enormous like Hulk Hogan's, but that's not the norm. So <laughs> keep in mind that the size of your arms is not going to be relevant to how hard you throw a ball. It doesn't work that way. Right. So you've got to train like an athlete, not a bodybuilder. Now, that being said, we still do some bicep work. If you're going to do regular bicep work and you're like, I don't want to deal with this iso stream or rebound stuff, fine, whatever. You know, you'll come back to us and say we were right later. I would say <laughs> stay away from the straight bar to start out with. At least go to a cambered bar. Go to a cambered bar and use, like, the angle grip. That's, a, that's fine. 
We do a lot of hammer curls. We do a lot of Zotterman curls as well. I love Zotterman curls. I think that's a very underrated exercise if you're looking at just general strength, like for the arm. You know what I mean with the Zotterman curl, Chris? Well, because a lot of people, I, I'm familiar with the name, but describe it for our audience just so they So know the Zotterman curl, like if you think about you're holding a dumbbell, just like you normally would with a curl where you're in supination or essentially the palm of your hand is facing the gym mirror, right? As you curl up, you get to the top, then you pronate to where now your palm is facing the ground, and then you slowly lower. I really like those. I don't go real heavy on them because it can put a lot of torque on the elbows for my athletes, but I do think that it engages the arm in a little bit of a different manner. It works the forearm, takes a little pressure off, works at different angles of the bicep. I also do those like rotational skull crushers, which are basically a tricep skull crusher like a Zotterman curl, you're doing the rotation as you go as well. So you're hitting a lot of different flexors and extensors while still getting the benefit of bicep activation or tricep. We'll do hammer curls. We'll do rope hammer curls, but we'll also do spider curls. I call them spider curls, which are reverse grip curls with a camber bar on an incline. So I'll get the incline bench. I'll lay face down on it. I'll have the camber bar or the Z shaped bar and I will hold in that where my palms are facing down. So I'm looking at the back of my hand and then curl up. That's another great traditional bicep exercise to do as well. That really builds the forearms, which actually goes into another point of athletes always wanting bigger forearms. Right. Well, I have it on record from a, uh, a, a decent guy. His jersey's uh, behind me. We talked about this one day, and if you're on audio, that's Brent Rooker's jersey behind us. I remember Brent and I were having this conversation. He's like, bro, I get my forearm work and arm work from heavy lifts. <laughs> so don't overdo the forearm work, guys. It comes with you know heavy lifts and stuff. But anyways, right. tangent there. Those are some good bicep alternatives if you want to do something aside from regular barbell curls, curls regular dumbbell curls. But again... The hypertrophy of the size of the muscle is not going to be relevant to how hard you throw a ball. It's actually probably going to hinder you. So you need to focus on that lengthening and that timing element. If you're going to do some curls, do you want to hit three or four sets? Cool. Then offset it with about a three-minute extreme slow bicep or something to lengthen that back out. Maybe get on the impulse machine. Work on that. That's how I would address getting some of the, you know, checking some of these boxes to ensure, like, hey, things are working the right way to help eliminate the cause of that elbow soreness. Right. Yeah, and it's it's still, let's face it, it's still an important muscle. But again, sure. we're talking about how you can use, how you can train it to use it. And by the way, you might get a little bit of hypertrophy with these iso extreme bicep curls. Um, certainly with with things like altitude and rebound. Which, by the way, yeah. <laughs> I would not start doing uh, uh, altitude or rebound bicep curls right off the bat that's one of those things yeah. that um you need, you need to have a little bit of background training before you hit those yep. but that's still it's a great way to train the timing mm -hmm. um, like john said the impulse curls um you can certainly do things like that which will again help you offset some of the problems with traditional types of strength training and some of the problems that it can bring into athletics right and these things will kind of help offset those things while still Absolutely. The biceps. Yes. And, and, the and another point that I want to make that I forgot is if you understand where size occurs, like how is it because of the endless reps that you're doing? No, it's because, well, yes and no. But if you understand that the hypertrophy or the size component of the muscle is built during the eccentric phase, then if you just slow the curl down and focus on the eccentric component, you're going to get the size benefit without having to do, you know, run the racks. You're not going to have to right. do that or countless drop or rest pause sets. You can focus on that eccentric and take less. You don't have to do as much volume. Right. So think of it that way. That's so, a good there point. There you go. I'll help you get some arm size, but try to keep you healthy as well. Yes, correct. All right. Question number two. We have an elite sprinter that runs a sub 10, 500 meter dash. And yet I've noticed that the uh, sprinters in the Olympics often run under 9.8 seconds. What separates this 
elite athlete from the super elite or the world class athlete. I mean, in this particular case, John, they're referring to someone running a 10 5 state champion to a 9 8 potential Olympic champion. Genetics. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's face wow. it, though, even those genetics, though, those guys were probably running, you know, 10 5 when they were in high school, also. Right. They were. I think there's a lot of components, but as we've discussed many times, what separates good athletes from elite athletes is the ability to contract and relax muscles. So we've said this before. Remember, we don't have a certain set of muscles to play a certain set of sports. Muscles contract and they lengthen. That's it. And the ability to do that efficiently The quicker you can lengthen and relax the muscle, the more efficient you become as an athlete. That's in a, that would be in a nutshell. What would you add to that, Chris? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like that's actually referring back to an old, oh gosh, I want to say that was Mel Sip, John, that brought up how um, the difference between say a national level athlete and an international level athlete. Again, we're probably going from like a 10, 500 meter runner to a nine, eight, 100 meter runner that okay that's that's where we're kind of drawing that line um uh yeah it's it's exactly what you said john it's being able to lengthen or we're going to use the word relax okay david dave Brewer, don't don't get too angry at us but relax and lengthen we're kind of using those words interchangeably but it, the ability to make a muscle lengthen more completely and faster and then be able to turn it back on more completely and faster that's what separates most international from most national level athletes. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's, that's a short answer, but that is the answer. Yeah. You can dig, you, you can break things down more and say, okay, this guy has better top end speed or this guy is better out of the gate. Yeah. You can go down that route, but in essence, what truly separates the great athletes is that ability to contract and lengthen a muscle. Yeah. And that goes into everything we've talked about on this show a million times at this point. Right. And, and by the way, John, that also goes into, let's face it, even when someone says about improving technique, as you say, as you get more advanced, a lot of times that improved technique leads to more complete relaxation and more complete, you know, shortening <laughs> and faster lengthening and shortening. So, so let's face it, even when we get down to something as fundamental as technique, which, by the way, is very important, um, it that's oftentimes what it's actually helping that athlete do. Yeah, and that brings up something. I'm, I'm thinking about this. I didn't plan this out, so I'm trying to be careful how what I say here. We, we won an Olympic gold medal in the Rio Olympics in Brazil. We were a part of an athlete who won down there. And I say we because we played a part in that. And the coach, I remember the coach sending me the text saying, hey, we just won. Congratulations. You won your first gold medal. (laughs) But I say that not I, I say that because what separates another element that can separate the elite from winning a silver or a gold medal can simply be whether a muscle is on or off. I'm not going to use this individual's name because we're not in contact anymore. Hadn't seen the guy since the Olympics, so I don't want to name drop uh, just for privacy reasons on his end. But I I remember there was nothing wrong. The athlete was very healthy. But just one little muscle shut down in the leg, That the ability for that muscle to do its job could have been the difference between a gold and a silver medal. You know what I mean? Oh, sure. So – it yeah. go, so that goes with it as well, which is some of the things we've talked about with NeuroTarget. Being able to ensure that the nervous system is engaged with the muscle to its maximum degree to, A, allow it to contract and relax more efficiently, B, to recruit more motor units faster, quicker, and if there is a delay in that signal process, that could cause a muscle to not do its job there's a perception of threat and that muscle shuts down and it could be a muscle super small like i mean it's not really small muscle but you know the posterior tibialis for example if that thing is inhibited 
that could be the difference right there in a tenth of a second. So yep. I think also ensuring that the nervous system is operating efficiently as well. Because I'm sure people will hear this and be like, okay, we well say contract and lengthen. Well, what, what does that mean? How do I do that? Well, if your body is in this protective state all the time and you're just super wired and wound tight, then your, your muscles are going to naturally be tighter. It's going to throw right. off your breathing pattern. It's going to cause different issues. So I genuinely, I genuinely do believe that efficiency of the nervous system plays a role in that too. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, John, I know that you and I kind of just teased about possibly mentioning a, a diaphragm breathing and how important that is. Well, just, just yeah. to your point that you just said, if you are more you know, parasympathetic, okay, rest and digest, diaphragm breathing type pattern, most of the time, most of your life, you're probably, probably going to perform much better than if you are constantly high strong. Right, sympathetic yeah. is, is kind of that high strung state. And that might be good for a very, very short burst um, in, a, in a very specific uh, uh, part of a competition. But you certainly cannot live life like that and ever expect no. to really improve. No, and that's a really good point. That reminds me of something that I experienced a, a couple months ago. There was a, a pitcher who was throwing, and the coach was telling him before every pitch, like trying to get him hyped up, like. <laughs> you know, hard, heavy breathing, you know, and they were trying to set different PRs and that was problematic. That, that, that's not right. Especially because yes, when you do that, if you get yourself all amped up right before, you know, you throw or you run, there's nothing wrong with that. Pending you naturally operate in a parasympathetic state. Yes, we know that, you know, the heavy breathing, breathing, the jumping, getting yourself mentally psyched up, you're going to release adrenaline and all these other things. Yes, of course. But if you keep doing that, you're only going to make things worse. And you're particularly going to make it worse if you're not already operating in a parasympathetic mode. So if this individual is already, their nervous system is wired tight because of whatever, then you try to psych them up. Maybe that first throw or first run will do okay, but it's going to drop off super fast. Right. Super yeah. fast. Ask anybody. So, yes, ask the any wrong football approach. player. Absolutely. Ask any football player who hypes up, up big time right before a game. Five minutes in, they're exhausted. They're yep. exhausted. And that's why I'm like, I'm not sure you want to get too hyped up right before any competition. You want to do it, you know, let your nervous system switch only as necessary, but you're still going to perform your best when you are predominantly in parasympathetic state, diaphragm breathing, Um, everything turned on, John, like you mentioned earlier, it all goes together. Yeah. I think if you look at the Patriots and Falcons Super Bowl a few years ago, I mean, well, it was probably more than a few years ago at this point. I mean, it had to be, what, seven, eight years ago where they were the Pats were down a ton and yep. they ended up coming back and winning, right? Yep. If you watch Tom Brady's body language and you watched how he – just his breathing pattern. I don't remember who brought that up to me. Somebody did. They, they said, watch his breathing pattern, and it was like first half, it was very high, labored breathing, but then the second half, low and slow, man, and the rest is history. So – that getting hyped up before every pitch is a ridiculous thing to do. Right. Same thing before a run. Getting hyped up before every single run is a ridiculous thing to do, particularly if you don't already operate in that parasympathetic state because you will cause muscles to shut down. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely correct. Cool. Well, that was a good question. It was a good question. What? Yes. We got anything else? We got another five minutes. I got time for extra sauce. Unless that's all we got today. Well, that's all we got for the for today. But you know, but still, guys, you know, one of the things though that that you know I have learned. In fact, I'm actually mentioned this to an athlete along that same point that we just made is that how many times, John, have you ever seen like muscles test weak or whatever, and all you do is get them to calm down and diaphragm breathe, and now things just work better. Yeah. Absolutely. You can, you can you literally know? muscle test somebody and have them think of a good thought versus a bad thought. And that in and of itself can shut a muscle down. Absolutely. Or turn it back on. Absolutely. Yes. 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 So, it's, it's energy flow guys. Yeah, exactly. 
And by the way, we're, we are in the future just for, you know, we are going to get more and bring on more people to discuss some of the questions that we've had, like regarding some of Jack Cruz's stuff. Guys, we're bringing, we're going to try to get, bring on more experts um, who are much more knowledgeable than John and I are, although John and I are trying to learn. And by the way, we are also, are also trying to get Dr. Cruz back on. Um, we have a bunch of questions um, that, that, that I get, and I'm sure John gets, regarding Jack Cruz's work. And honestly, as much as I would love to be able to an- make good, intelligent uh, an- responses to those questions, uh, that's almost above our pay grade, John. Wouldn't you sort of agree? Almost, no. It's way above our pay grade. Yes. Okay. No way above our. I was being. But generous. yeah, we're, we're going to have him back. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up, and, and I want to. I want to close out on that. The reason that I say, guys, help us spread this message and share, is because we are getting censored. All you got to do is go look at our traffic. Go to my YouTube page and look at our traffic. You'll see the episodes where we were like Matt Boulay and me and Chris talk about stuff or Jack Cruz. YouTube ripped one of our episodes down, and I got a notification that we were, we were per- spreading misinformation, violating, violating their medical guidelines and all that other garbage. And it was, Jack, it was that part two with Jack Cruz. And so when I tell you guys, if you, if you get value out of this, share this show and help us. Yep. Because – we live in a world now where they're trying to censor good things. And, yeah, they took us down. So and I, we're going to put another episode out. I was like, oh, we're right, man. We actually- <laughs> yeah, I did too. I immediately messaged Dr. Cruz like, let's go. Let's do this again. Yeah. So, yeah, share the show, guys. Spread the message. Um, but those are good questions. Those are good points. I do want to wrap up with one thing, though, that I forgot to mention earlier. And I kind of take back what I said about not running ads on the show. But, guys, I want to give a shout-out to NewFit. And if you're interested in the newbie, they uh, NewFit has a special offer for Starting Block podcast listeners. Guys, if you go to new.fit slash starting block, new.fit forward slash starting block, they got some info and special stuff for you there. So check it out if you're interested in digging into the newbie and seeing all the great things that NewFit can do. You know, they're, uh, they're Garrett Sal Peters, the man, new fit. He's been on numerous times. So give him a, give it, uh, give it a look. If you're interested, new dot fit forward slash starting block. It rocks. Yeah, guys. guys. It rocks. Hell yeah, it does. So guys, that's the show. Appreciate you guys. Love you guys. We're going to get back on track a little bit. This summer has been pretty hectic for both of us, but we're going to get the Q and a scheduled a little bit more frequently and keep things rolling. So appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Thank you guys.